Hey guys, and um, welcome to the Nihilist 92 podcast. This is the first episode in a series that I'm going to be doing. Um, the whole idea is to have people on who play in bands or run YouTube channels um, and just chat to them about what got them playing, um, their first memories of music, what bands inspire them, what artists inspire them, and different projects they've got going on. Uh, my first episode is with Mr. Sam Lawson of the band Alaya. Sam and I are actually friends from way back. We go all the way back to high school and sixth form. Um, and he's been in quite a few different bands since then. So we got to talk about, you know, his musical journey from starting to play guitar all the way to his first band, uh, moving up into where he is now with his band Alea, which are a metalcore band based out of Chester and Manchester, UK. We also got to talk about gear, uh, what guitars Sam's using, what he looks for in a guitar and amps and stuff like that. Uh, we also talked about uh, his band, Alaya, and how he writes music and how that band as a whole writes music together. Um, and also we talked about the inner workings of a band and the music business and the business aspect of, of running a band in this day and age. So yeah, it's a pretty cool episode to have as the first one. As like I said, Sam and I are friends and we go way back. So without further ado, I'll stop nattering now and um, here's, the, uh, here's the full interview. Okay, guys, uh, I'm here with my uh, longtime friend, Sam, of the band Alea. Uh, how are you doing, Sam? Um, I'm very good, Jazz. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. I'm so glad uh, we could do this. You're actually the first person who's agreed to do this this podcast thing, so... It feels thought, like an honor. Yeah, it, I thought it would be a nice, easy one, knowing that we're friends, so if we get anything screwed up and stuff, it's... I mean, we, we do have a good, what, 10, 15 years history? Yeah, absolutely. So I know if it was all wrong at my end, you could forgive me. Um, <laughs> okay. I like to think if it was wrong on my end, you just shout at me as well. Tell me to get it <laughs> okay, so for those of you who don't know, like I said, um, <clears throat> Sam and I have, have been friends for many years. We back, go all the way back to high school. Um, so we've always had sort of like an awareness of one another's musical growth, if that makes sense. It's sort of like... Uh, whether we've like jammed together or we used to talk about bands and school guitars, all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's interesting now that we're a lot older um, to see kind Too of, old. yeah, where, where we're at now on our musical journeys, if you like. So for those of you who don't know, Sam plays in a metalcore band based out of uh, Chester and Manchester called Alea. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's get, let's go right back to the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. th the first question I want to ask you is what's your earliest memory of music? So before heavy metal, before metalcore, before you even played guitar, way back into your childhood, what's your earliest memory? <clears throat> so there's bound to be actual earlier things that I did with music, but the, the earliest thing I can remember is being sat in my bedroom with a CD player listening to an S Club 7 album. And I can't remember what song it is. I think it's it's probably Reach, to be fair, because absolute tune. I just remember sitting there listening to it in my CD player. I was like, this song is incredible. This is the best song ever. And that was genuinely my first like introduction to music was an S Club 7 album and then straight after that, a Steps album. <laughs> yeah, I think um, <clears throat> you and I coming from sort of coming from like growing up the same age it was s club seven for me as well i don't know what it was it was kind of like every kid that age was listening to s club if you went to parties and stuff that was always being played um, yeah and everyone um lied about whether they were going to be in the s club juniors or not when the s club, <laughs> club seven split up that was that was a weird thing every single kid was like yeah i'm going to be in the s club s club juniors like mm, no you're not <laughs> and here's a fun fact for you all i actually saw s club 7 live at the manchester arena when i was a kid and you know what it's one of the best concerts i've ever been to as a matter of fact that was my first concert growing from there um how did that turn into guitar playing how old were you when you first started so i was i think i was 
12 or 13 when I got my first guitar. And the reason I wanted to play guitar, and it's the genuine reason, do you remember the program Drake and Josh? Yeah, I do. Drake looked so cool with his red Stratocaster. As I, I remember. Yeah. He just looks so cool. I, I want to be like that. But I remember one of my friends had uh, it was Stratocaster copy, but he had a cherry red one. So like, mm, I can't do that then, can I? So I got a tobacco sunburst one. And um, I got it when I was like 12 or 13. And it was the best guitar ever. I mean, obviously, looking back, it wasn't, but it was incredible. And was that something you, you bugged your parents for? Or was it? It was, a, it was a Christmas present, I think. I think um, I'd always like shown interest in like, oh, I want a guitar, I want a guitar. But then it kind of like fizzled out after a couple of weeks. And okay. then this was, this was like starting from when I was like seven or eight, I think. Um, but when I asked for this, this electric guitar kit, because you could get the amp, the guitar, a case and everything with it. And I just kept going on and on and on. I was like, I want this guitar. So eventually my parents relented and let me get this guitar for Christmas. And I was so happy. Cool. Did, um, was it an immediate sort of thing for you or did it sit by the wayside for a bit or did you have lessons straight away? So I never had lessons, but I did always play it all the time. Um, I was pretty consistent with playing it, but never consistent with practicing it. So I'd, I'd learned some songs from bands I liked, play them, let's be honest, probably pretty terribly. And, and that was enough for me. I was, I was absolutely made up for it with it. And I'd go in and show my parents and I'd be like, look, look at this thing I could play. And they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's certainly a guitar, Sam. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and it took me a very long time before I started actually taking it seriously. Okay, so you had no lessons whatsoever. You're completely self-taught. Yeah, entirely self-taught. I've, apart from Wikipedia, never had a lesson. See, I, I always thought you had uh, lessons in that little shop in Mould. Um, uh, back alley music. Yeah, yeah. No, never. I've, I, I never even. I never even wanted guitar lessons because, okay. I mean, it just. It just. To me, at least, it seemed like it sapped the fun from it. Like I didn't want to go and like okay. go to school for it. I just wanted to sit down and play System of a Down. <laughs> okay, and and that sort of brings me on to my um my next question. Really, what was what was the inspiration? What who were the bands that you discovered? Did you discover bands through guitar, or did you kind of have music you were into before that made you want to play? I think it was more I discovered the music from the bands. So the first song I ever learned on guitar was Toxicity by System of a Down. Okay. And after that, I went straight into attempting to learn the anthem by Trivium. And I could not do it, like, at all. Like, the concept of proper palm muting just meant nothing to me. I had no idea what it was. So, um, no, I didn't really discover many bands from playing guitar, but I did discover a lot of songs from bands I knew I already liked. Okay. Because... I'd always not, I'd, I'd no singles from bands and, I, and I'd think, well, this was a good song and I can play on the time now, so what else there I could play? Okay. And it, it kind of went that way. R rather than learning about more bands, I just learned more about the bands that I did like. Toxicity. I'm pretty sure that's a, like a, a drop, isn't that like a drop C or something like that? At, at that young it's... age, did you, did you figure out how to tune your guitar down? And Nope. I played it in standard. <laughs> okay. It was a drop C song that I played in standard, but because my musical ear back then was so atrociously bad yeah, yeah. that the fact that I was playing the right frets to me, it sounded right. And I mean, looking back, it was, it was awful. I was playing it in standard E tuning when it's a song in C, <laughs> uh, but because I was playing it relatively in time with the song, it, it, was, it was fine to me. So no, I didn't, I didn't even um, drop, ever drop tune my guitar until like, Maybe three, four years after getting it. Okay, okay. But I still played drop tune songs on it. Okay. <laughs> in standard. And um, at, at what point did you sort of um, think, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at this. I think I want to start jamming with people and probably playing bands. Uh, <laughs> a long time later. Um, okay. So I started when I was like 12, 13. And I mean, I was playing in bands up until like up through that time. But the first time I thought, all right, no, I can, I can probably play in a band now was when I was 20, but okay. I'd been in two or three, maybe three, three or four bands before then. 
but there was never anything of like, yeah, I'm going to, I think I can be good in this band. It was just a case of, you, you, you play guitar, you play drums. I play guitar. And it never, never went well. Absolutely never went well. I was, I was not good at playing in time for years and years. Yeah. Um, but it, there was always that, that drive to want to jam with other people and play yeah. music. That you oh, like. yeah. Yeah. I remember um, even in um, like my first two years of playing guitar, I got one of my friends around and we were just playing Paramore songs really yeah. badly, really out of time. Again, um, I think they're, they're drop tune songs, but we played them in standard. Yeah. And it was, it was great, just absolutely butchering these songs, but it was so much fun. <laughs> yeah, there, there is that, um, I can remember when I, was, when I got my first Explorer guitar, right? I um, remember that guitar. <laughs> it was an ESP EX50, right? The low end LTD guitar, but it was to me, it was, I've got an Explorer, I'm James Hetfield. And, <laughs> yeah, and, I, I, and I can remember just putting my earphones in, listening to Metallica live in 89, just strutting around my room, doing all the power stance, just literally pretending to be them and thinking I'm cool, you know? But oh like, yeah, because I, that's all you need. All you need is the good guitar and to play the songs. You're like, I, I can do what they can do. That's it. And it, it didn't matter that you know, your, your picking and your timing was all out. It was just that no. sort of, that innocent discovery of music that I kind of, yeah. I kind of miss. We, we've talked about this many, many times, like the bands that we're into, the amount of times you and I have said to one another, I wish I could go back and rediscover everything. Yeah. I wish I could learn guitar again. I remember that the one for me was when I realized that um, the Waking the Demon main riff wasn't as hard as I thought it could be. Yeah. Like I remember just learning it and I played it for the first time and I like I was just like amazed at like I was doing this thing. I was playing this riff that I've been listening to for ages and it wasn't that that like mind bendingly difficult to play. Those uh those click moments. Yeah. They're absolutely because uh, in, in school, um there was a couple of guys who played and I was, I was either, I hadn't even, even started at that point. And you see other people playing, you think that's witchcraft. I could never do that. Yeah. And you hear stuff from people. I remember somebody saying like, oh, that master of puppets riff is absolutely impossible because you've never tried it. That's in your head that this, it's that in, in, this yeah. impossible riff. And I remember one day when I was younger, sitting down with my Strat knockoff and I just got the tab for it and I played it and it was like, oh, it's not that hard. I, I can do it. What, what am yeah. I missing here? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I was like as well, because um, I did the same thing. I remember um, when I first learned Master of Puppets, I played it for um, a, a GCSE music performance. Obviously, I stopped before it got to the Kirk solo, obviously. <laughs> but I just remember the first time I learned that um, that clean guitar bit before the first solo. Yeah, yeah. right. And right. I just remember thinking, like, I thought this was going to be really, really hard to do, but it's actually really not. And it, that was another just like mind like moment of okay maybe maybe I, maybe I can actually do this. And it, it, it's it's the discovery as well. Um, I remember. I mean, I've mentioned it on my channel before, um, and you know yourself. The riff that started it for me was "Sad but True" Metallica. Yeah. And it's that whole learning and not knowing in the mystery. I just couldn't figure it out. I downloaded every tab I could find, and it still sounded wrong. And I remember sitting on the floor with my ear earphones in and listening to the guitar and I'm thinking I'm, I'm playing it the way every tab sa says to play it. And it sounds wrong. And I just could not figure it out. And it's like, well, it's tuned down. It's in D standard. You, you don't know right. about that yet. And discovering yeah. all those things later on. Yeah, it's, um, it, it, it is magic, those years of sort of innocence with learning. And, and that kind of brings me on to the next thing, really. Um, as far as the bands who, in, who inspired you then, but also now, who would you say some of those guys are, or even guitar players? <clears throat> Back then, um, I think Kill Switch Engage and uh, Escape the Fate were the two main ones for me. Like the super thick sounding, like chuggy palm mutant from, especially Kill Switch Engage. I mean, you know the song Reject Yourself, that those triplet uh, palm mutes. It was it was things like that, and it was it was it was those songs that I'd always listened to and thought like, oh, I, that's that's never going to be able to be something I can play. And then it was all just those those metalcore bands. But then now, 
I don't really, I wouldn't really say that I get inspired by other guitarists anymore. I more get inspired by certain techniques I see people do. Okay. But I think Sinister Gates is definitely up there. I mean, you and me have spoken about Sinister Gates a lot. His, his sweet picking and his chromatic stuff is stuff that I've learned years ago and I still do now. Like a lot of sweet picking and a lot of trying to get good chromatic sounding like riffs and leads because a, a lot of times it's a, very easy to make a chromatic riff or a chromatic lead just sound like you've hit a wrong note. Yeah, yeah. But Sinister Gates is very, very good at putting in chromatic notes that sound like they have to be there. Yeah, of course. And that's, that's probably the biggest takeaway I think I've ever had from a guitar player is getting in good sounding chromatic notes can take a song from like, from like here to here just by putting in one of those like creepy, eerie sounding notes. Yeah, awesome, man. So moving forward from that, who was, um, who was your first band? Or what was your first band? My first band was an absolute shit show. It was, um, it was in sixth form. Um, I don't think we even had a band name. All I remember was we were going to play a gig at a sixth form party at the TIFF in Buckley. And um, the, we did two or three new songs and Smells Like Teen Spirit. And that was the entire set list, like three, maybe four songs. And uh, we had three practices, three rehearsals uh, for these songs I'd never played before. Um, but I, th I think the other two guys um, knew how to play the songs. And because I was at the age where, you know, drinking was cool, I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll drink before the, the, the gig, obviously. I'll have, I'll have a, few, a few drinks. I was only like 17 as well. 17, 16? And then we got on stage and I mean, I was, I was very young. So these few drinks really hit me quite hard and I was just too drunk to play the songs. And it was an absolute travesty. It was my first ever gig. It was the worst ever gig I've ever played, I think. And conveniently after that gig, the other two guys were like, hmm, probably shouldn't be in the band anymore, should we? I was like, mm, you're probably right, yeah. <laughs> so that was the very first band. It lasted the best part of two and th two to three weeks, and it was an absolute shit show. But you needed to do it. It was your first experience, you know? <laughs> Honestly, luckily, yeah. It didn't put you off for life. <clears throat> no, it was, well, it put me off for a good few weeks, to be fair. But <laughs> I, think, I think when you're in a band, you need to play a shit gig at least once, like a really yeah. bad one. And uh, luckily for me, that was my very first one. So I got that out of the way <laughs> really quickly. And moving on from that, then, um, you moved, uh, you actually uprooted and went to university in Manchester and started other bands yep. there, am I right? Um, yeah, so me and one of my um, housemates at the time, my housemate was a drummer, so when we lived together, we'd play along to some Avenged Sevenfold songs, but okay. then it was, it was after uni, one of my friends uh, just messaged me on Facebook, and he was like, oh, you, you like um, A Day to Remember, don't you? And I was like, yeah, big fan of A Day to Remember, because they're heavy. And he was like, well, if you like a day to remember, you'll really like this pop punk band I'm in. I was like, mm, uh, okay. may maybe, but it was one of my good friends. So I was like, yeah, I like pop punk probably. Um, and to audition for this pop punk band, I played them an Avenged Sevenfold guitar solo okay. on my BC Rich Warlock. So they probably should have known what they were getting themselves into really. So yeah, I joined that band when I was 21. And I mean, eventually I did end up liking pop punk music. I was around it all the time, but it was, it was inevitable I would end up liking it. But at the time I was just this, <laughs> this little ginger metalhead kid trying to be in a pop punk band. Okay, so I was gonna ask, what was the, uh, the motivation to start playing pop punk music coming from a metalcore sort of background? The motivation was two of my really good friends were in the band and I wanted to be in a band. It was literally that. Simple as that. Yeah, just wanted to be in a band, wanted to hang out with two of my good friends. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, why not? Yeah, okay, cool. And there was, there was very little resistance to me joining the band. Even though I was the metal kid, they were like, yeah, okay. And you, you really came around to that style of playing as well. You started to enjoy writing it. And... Yes, yeah, it, took, it yeah. took a good few years. And mainly once that band dissolved and turned into the, the next band, that was when the writing of pop punk music like, really came out of me. And 
I really do really enjoy it. I still, like, I still really enjoy listening to pop punk. And even though I'm in metal bands now, I still write pop punk stuff. I still play along to it. I really got indoctrinated into being a pop punk kid. <laughs> right. Okay. And um, the 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 latter one of those bands, um, Open Waters, right? Open Waters, yeah. Yeah, they. Uh, you had a, a single with that band, am I right? And uh, music videos, am I right? We had, yeah. We it was a very yeah. very short lived band. We had two singles, one music video and one lyric video. What was um, what was the key to getting that success? Was it all just solely driven by your own sort of drive? I think so. Two of the members of Open Waters were in the previous band. So we had from from all the gigs and all the, the people we chat to, we had like a lot of a lot of connections. So we managed from that, we managed to get our first gig in Satan's Hollow of all places. We managed to headline Satan's Hollow. And because we we were really well involved in like the pop punk scene, so we managed to get a lot of people who knew our old band to then come to listen to our, our, our new band. And okay. In my opinion, the music was such a step up from the old band that yeah. I think that's what kept them in. I think because they, they knew us and like we were all friends. So they were like, oh, yeah, we'll check out this band. And then because the music was such a higher quality, in, in my opinion, at least, I think that's what probably got them to stay, stay and stick around for us. Sometimes it, it takes those transitional periods to see the music uh, absolutely grow. and especially yeah. with, with age as well especially and when you look back at stuff and when you you've been in a previous involved with previous projects you listen back to the music you've made and then you compare it to where you're at now it really sort of gives yeah. you that clarity yeah where you i think be and... i think the music in the in the, the the first band was it was it was definitely all right i um i don't i don't think it's bad music but then when we listen you listen to that and then listen to the open water songs i think it's a big step up because we were we kind of stuck in a rut with um, the old band, Not Today, where we, we kind of sort of almost like like pushed ourselves into a corner of our sound. We were very like very much like a your typical pop punk band. But then when we got to Open Waters, we kind of reinvented it a little bit, kind of kind of tried to make it a little bit more alt rocky. And I think that kind of pushed through a lot in the music. You could tell there was a lot more of like a like an alternative rock kind of vibe in it. Okay, cool. And um, how were the gigs? Uh, all, all the gigs were pretty good, to be fair. I mean, yeah. we, we headlined Satan's Hollow for the, the first gig, so that was amazing. That's we, um, we supported another band who were on tour in Satan's Hollow again. We played a festival in Blackpool, and we, we didn't really gig much in the, the one and a half, two years we were together, but the, the gigs we played were, were really fun. Did having the uh, the sort of the mileage from the previous bands, did that make it a bit easier for you to get gigs and, and stuff like that? Definitely. Yeah. had names for yourselves? Yeah, well, it was more we knew the promoters. Like, we were, we were good friends with a couple of promoters. So they'd seen our, our old band play gigs and saw that we had a pretty good turnout for people coming to see us. So because we had that sort of like two-way relationship of being able to help each other out, them putting us on gigs and us getting people in to, to, to come to the gigs, um, we kind of already had that relationship with them. I want to ask here um, about your gear, just moving on from the bands. Um, what's, what's your current gear that you're using for live, live shows? So I have and, and a... Studio? I've got a Marshall MG head and a Marshall, I think it's a four by 12 cab that I use. Okay. Uh, I've got pedal board with uh, a Boss uh, distortion overdrive pedal, uh, a noise gate, a delay pedal, um, a compressor and obviously a tuning pedal. And the guitars I use are either my ESP Eclipse, ESP EC401 or my new um, ESP Telecaster, so the ESP TE401. And that's that's my live setup. It's very it's a very simplistic one to be fair. It's just amp head pedal board, guitar covered in EMGs. It's fine. <laughs> uh, as for studio, um, I normally take a back seat when it comes to gear in the studio because like I kind of trust the producers we go to because they 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 hear the demos. They they I tell them about the gear I've got, what kind of sound I'm going for, and they they always nail it really. But generally. Um, so the first two Alea songs, we used a Kemper to record it. I know uh, you and me talk about Kempers all the time. Yeah, man. And then um, 
for Man of Glass and our upcoming single, we used uh, a different studio and we use an XFX for that. So generally we don't use uh, live amps and live pedals for recording. It just goes straight through um, the XFX or a Kemper. It's so much easier these days, especially Honestly, in st stay the dream. Out with that. Which do you prefer, just, the Kemper or the XFX? Um, oh God, I don't know. I don't know. I think for me, I personally, from the looks of things, um, I'd say the Kemper looks more user friendly. Yeah, you, watching the the producer use the software for the Kemper as well, it did seem really straightforward. I think to me, they're they're both the same to me. I don't I don't um, really like I've never experimented with both of them enough. Yeah, but yeah. they both they both seem perfect. I think price wise, I'd want to go for the Axe Effects because it's a lot more affordable. But I think if, if I could, I think so. The you're looking at a couple grand for a Kemper, and I think you're looking at about a grand or so for an Axe Effects, or maybe it's just the ones I've been looking at. Maybe I've been looking at older models. Okay, I thought Axe like Effects was more expensive. I like to tease myself and go on eBay and see uh, how much I can buy myself a Kemper or an Axe Effects for. Uh, hey, I before I started doing um doing music again, I. I priced up how much it would be. I, I thought, right, I'm going to do it properly. I'm going to get a computer. I'm going to get a camper and get the power head. And then I'm going to get a interface and all that stuff. And as soon as you start listing the stuff you need, it's like, it, yeah, yeah, you, you got to you, you want to get a camper. OK, but you're going to need to get um, a, a power amp to power that thing. Or you could spend the extra 500 pound and get the power head that's already got a power amp built into it. And just the money just keeps going up and you just up and look up. at you just look at the cost of it. It's like, do I want a camper? Or do I want to eat for the next few months? <laughs> I know. <laughs> and, Unfortunately, um, as much as I'd love a camper, I can't uh, stain myself off it. But the gear, years. um, the gear you're using now, though, your your amp, it's it's you're like myself. I'm not a massive gearhead. I, as a matter of fact, I really no. don't like gear. I it, I just want to plug in and go. When it comes to expensive guitars different story like, <laughs> yeah when it comes to like people who love like signal chains and um you know this compressor and this pedal and i'm running into the computer and all that stuff the whole thing hurts my head i just want to play yeah. and and that's that's not an ignorance that's just probably me not being clever enough i don't know um, I, th I think that's the same case with me but i just like i like a nice bare bone setup i, I like to i mean marshall's have a great clean tone so i can yeah. keep the clean tone of the marshall run it straight through the, the boss distortion overdrive, get a very simple sound. And then when I need to get to the clean parts, I can use the Marshall clean tone. So I've, I've got no reason to like look into preamps or all these other different uh, pedals I can get for now, at least because I can get the sound I want out of the pedal and the, the amp head. And what's interesting as well is you're using a solid state there as well. Um... So the, the, the proof is in the pudding there that you don't yeah. need a, a really expensive tube amp to no. to play gigs. No, I've, I've um, jammed with people with, with tube heads and, well, tube amps as well before. And again, maybe it's an ignorant thing on my part, but they seem like so much more effort than it's worth. It can be. I, I've had tubes in the past and I've got a hybrid here. Um, I love it. But the problem is with, with the tube amp is especially if you're a you're a bedroom player at home or you you know you're not touring regularly or anything like that you have to push it to that sweet spot to get the, yeah. the best punch out of it when they're cranked up oh my god absolutely incredible and that there's nothing i mean all these um uh plugins and, and and emulators and stuff they they want that warmth that a tube amp has but yeah if you're not but if you can't crank it to that volume to get that sweet spot I think a lot of people just own them just to say, oh, well, I own, I yes. own a tube amp. But it's like, yeah. man, you never go past once in number one in your bedroom. I remember I had a tube amp years and years ago, um, a carving um, that Steve Vai used to own. There's a little fun fact for you all. Um, I had a carve, this carving amp and it was, it was hot rodded and it was so loud. And in my bedroom, I think I only got to one and a half and I went away. And I came back and I was, I was a lot younger. I was living with my nan. I think she'd cleaned my room or something and she'd knocked it onto five. Oh, no. And I came home and a couple of days, oh, I think I'll play guitar. And I plugged it in and I switched it on. Do, you know um, Michael J. Fox, right? It's back to the yeah. future. 
<laughs> it was so, so loud. And all that power just for what I was doing at home was just so unnecessary. Granted, the if thing I was, about, I was gigging, it would have been. Well, you say that, but when it comes to gigs, when you've got a bunch of bands who have to, because normally you share the drum kit and the cabs, but you use your own heads. So you'll, you'll finish your set with, with your, uh, your tube amp and then the other bands want to load in their gear and you're like, oh, I need 10 minutes for it to cool down. You're going to have to wait. Mm. It kind of really pisses people off sometimes when you're using yeah. a tube amp, and, and, unless you're the headliner, because people just want to get their gear on stage. Yeah, and I think things have moved forward massively as well. Like, I don't think there's a lot of people now who are using real heads live. There are a lot of pure Puritans out there, I suppose, which I'm more part of. Absolutely love that sound, and a lot of it is to do with the feel. Um, but for instance, even Metallica, they've moved yeah. on to I, oh, that. I mean, you were there at the Manchester gig with me. That whole thing yeah. was run on X, Axe effects, and it sounded absolutely great. But this is the thing: the tone you use to record in the studio, you just load it up on the Axe effects, and then you can play it live. You don't. There's no having to match the tone or like balance your live sound and like make sure the guitarists gear matches up it's just you plug it you load in that tone in the axe effects and, and you're good to go and then even if you're going through like back catalog songs that maybe had a different tone you just load in that tone yeah it makes and things so much easier it's, it just it's, it just makes perfect sense to use it also as well the cost of shipping gear around the globe um heads and stuff like that and also you can you could roll up to a venue and you tubes could have been blown because of in, yeah. in transit stuff like that it makes so much more sense the other thing as well a lot of people have said well won't you miss the the sort of the punch wow no. what a lot of bands will do is they'll have like a cab dedicated to it i watched a rig run down the other day with james hetfield's guitar tech and there's literally two cabs on stage literally just punching out the raw power literally just for james to feel it coming at him it's not for the entire sound of the of the gig itself, shall I say, that's yeah. all coming over the PA. But if he wants to feel the air being pushed, he's got a couple of cabs on stage. So. See, I'm, I'm not that bothered about that. If I can get the guitar sounding good, just give me the axe effects. I as think, as, um, sorry, go on, I cut you off there, man, go on. Just as long as, as long as the tone sounds good to people in the audience, I'm happy. I think uh, a long time ago, um, Black Veil Brides were one of the first bands to start doing this and start to just use the PA just like campus or whatever it was, Axe Effects just going straight over the PA, straight into the desk. And they got absolutely slated yeah. for it. Black and Veil I'd... Brides get a lot of hate for no reason, let's be honest. But that could have been anyone, but I think it was yeah. because it was them. And of course all it was. of a sudden, everybody is following suit, doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. I mean, they're all, they're all like incredible musicians. Like back to the, the guitar influences thing as well. Like Jake Pitts from Black Veil Brides is up there with, in my opinion, one of the best guitarists. But because they're in Black Veil Brides, they get a lot of shit thrown at them. Yep, it's unfortunate, isn't it? I really, I honestly do really rate them as a band. Um, so moving on from your gear, one thing that I wanted to ask you is, what's your dream gear? Guitars, amps, heads? My dream gear is the Kemper or the Axe FX, whichever one gets thrown at me. And guitar-wise, it's probably the two guitars I've got. Genuinely, the EC four hundred one and the TE four hundred one are just just perfect for me. I've got no no reason to want or need a guitar any better. I guess if I could get an ESP with a Floyd Rose, may, maybe that. But honestly, I think just give me a Kemper, and I'm done. All I need is a Kemper or an Axe FX, and I'll keep the other gear and guitars I've got, and then I'm sorted. That's cool, man. That's nice to have that. Um feeling of uh, being satisfied with the gear that you've got. I've got to say, I'm pretty much the same. Um, my Matt Tuck BC Rich that gets quite a lot of attention on this channel. Um, I didn't realize, I, I, think I, 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 think, I think I knew how rare they were, but I didn't realize how once I started doing videos and stuff like that, people were like, where the hell did you get that? Um, and there's only a few people out there who, who have got them. And those few people, I've, I've actually spoken to, we all seem to find each other. It's quite strange. And it's like, where the how did you get... BC rich group. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, where did you get yours from? And stuff like that. And people always ask, but if somebody was to say, what is your dream guitar? It is that. I, yeah. I absolutely love it. It's the shape of it. I love the way it sounds. And I, I would love to have another one custom built because BC rich won't make them anymore. Um, 
I'd love to have something set very similar built at some point. Mm. Um, so rather than just go and trial and error with different guitar companies and stuff like that. If I was to get another guitar, I think I'd just love to spend the extra money and have something based on that. Yeah. Built. Well, that's why I got the, the TE because I knew I liked the Eclipse. It was perfect. So just get a guitar that's basically, basically built the same way. I mean, they're basically the same guitar, but different shapes. So I, I got one guitar that was, it was basically perfect for me. So branch out a little bit, get another one that, basically looks nice and works the same and, and I'm good. That's, that's me done. The, the only two guitars I need. I mean, I say that we'll see, see what happens in the next few years. Maybe they'll release a new shiny oh, one. Yeah, there you go. And for instance, if I don't know, an ESP MX 250 came up online, which is James Hetfield's old, old explorers for, you know, with a big hockey stick headstock and all that. Yeah. I'd, um, if I, if I could, if I had the funds to just like jump on one of them, of course I would. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I am, I'm waiting for the day you give me your ESP snake bite. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've, I'll leave that in the will for you. Anything happens. As a matter of I fact. Was, yeah. No, I was, I was, I was um, actually speaking about this a few days ago, talk, talking about wills. It was really morbid. And I was like, oh, I don't know what I'd, what I'd leave anyone. And then straight, I was like, no, the BC Rich Ironbird jazz is getting that. Yeah, man. <laughs> Straight away. Like, I was looking at all my guitars. I was like, what do you want, the, the telly or the Eclipse? Like, no, nah, he's, he's getting the Iron Bird. <laughs> no, I, I was thinking of leaving you the Malia, the Epiphone Malia. Oh, just of course. <laughs> It'd be like you, like, trying to... you like that guitar if it wasn't for the neck. If it wasn't for the neck feeling like I'm holding a barrel, it'd be great. <laughs> but that's why I like the Snake Bikes. It's got ESP of really like nice thin necks, and it's, it's perfect. But that that um that Lee Malia Epiphone, I feel like I'm like this trying to play it. So your current band, Alea, how did that happen? How did that come about? So when I was in Open Waters and the rest of the other guys, they were in another band as well at the time. They were in a band called Dead's Forever. And both bands were sort of dissolving at around the same time. So me and Tom, who's the vocalist of Alea, uh, we've we've been friends for like 10 years, almost 15 years now as well. We'd always chat about metal music. We'd jam together. Um, I think 10 or so years ago, we'd jam together in bands as well, even then. So we all knew of each other. We all knew that we were all in bands. We were all musically involved. And those guys knew that I was into metal music as well. Like I'd sometimes, um, they'd, in one of Dead is Forever songs, that, that there was my section where I got to go up and do vocals. So they, they, all, they all knew I was into metal and everything. Cool. So we just we just went for um, a jam around the time that both bands had finished, and we just started writing some songs. And we all realised that we could easily make this work as a band. Like it started off initially as just a you know like a little jam session, but we realised we could easily make it work into a band. So we just started writing, uh, bounced around a few name ideas, um, landed on a layer. I think the original name that James came up with, the drummer was um, a layer ghost lights, which is a band name he'd always wanted for, for years and years. So we, we condensed it down to a layer and um, we went and recorded our first two songs uh, just before Open Waters ended. So there's a little bit of like a crossover transition. And it just, it just went from there. We, I think about six months later, we released the first song. Did you know you were sat on something? certain something good when you were doing those first two songs absolutely yeah um because it was the first time i'd actually been in a proper metal band a proper metalcore band yeah. so it was my first time actually taking some of the ideas i've had made over the past few years and um putting them together but the thing is with um the first two songs we recorded none of that was old material that was all stuff that we just worked on and made fresh and i, I think i think you can tell when you've written a good song. And when, when we first um, listened back to Survive, we were like, yeah, this is definitely going to be something that people are going to like. And we were just so happy with it. And all the music we've been writing and recording since then, we've been able to tell it's, it's something that's, that's going to be good. Like, there's, there's never been a moment where we've had to be like, all right, if I can put this in, then you can put that in. Or oh, if I can if I can record this song, then you can record that song. It's always been unanimously like, what song should we record? We'd all we were all like surviving, losing sleep, absolutely. 
then we went for the, the next set of studio sounds like right which of these songs should we record man of glass and deceive easily there was there was no like compromises or everything because we were all just fully in agreement of what we'd written was good and what we were going to record cool man and uh you got quite a bit of success to start out with as well because you had pre-existing followings so you had a, an audience yeah. to announce this music to yeah so um all the people from that knew of me from not today in open waters they checked out the alaya stuff and then because i mean dead is forever three of the members from dead is forever are now in alaya so they managed to basically the, the fan base basically crossed over immediately and it just, it just it worked out really well there was there was a lot of the, the groundwork we'd have had to have done to get people to like friends and family even to, to know who we are it was it was already done because people were asking me like so what are you gonna do now that open water isn't a thing and people were asking them so what are you gonna do now that dead is forever isn't a thing and we'd already had people interested in what we were going to be putting out before we'd even put it out cool and how do you go about maintaining that momentum social media social yeah. media is absolutely the biggest thing like um obviously it's been really hard to keep posts going because we started like a layer started a few months before the pandemic hit so all these lockdowns came and so we weren't even able to gig we were planning our first gig and like sorting out the logistics of it just as the, the lockdown was announced so it's been, it's been pretty hard to keep momentum going on our side from all, all the things we can post. But we've had, we've had song releases, we've got the music videos, we've got like behind the scenes um, studio and video photos and footage we can post. So it's just trying to keep active on social media, just constantly trying to put out content so that we can keep fans engaged. Yeah, it is a matter of that sort of constantly being in people's faces, I guess, dare I say, for want of a better expression. Yeah. If you I think at, a lot of um, people are always scared of overdoing it. It's like, oh, what if people get bored? What if people yeah. uh, get sick of seeing it? But I mean, the end of the day is that they're not going to be following your band's social medias if they weren't interested in it. That's precisely what I found with um, a lot of YouTubers and stuff that I've followed. Um, yeah. I've seen a lot of people since the pandemic go all in. And their stories, yeah. just stories. It's the simplest thing, but Instagram stories, they're just brrr, all loaded at the top yeah. of stuff to, to to click through, polls. It's just keeping the name sort of in, in, in mind. As long as yeah. you can keep, uh, like in my case, my band name, in your case, channel name, as long as you can keep keep people remembering it and keep people seeing it. It, it yeah. doesn't have to constantly lead to like loads of engagement or load of conversions, like for me going to Spotify, for you going to YouTube, you just need to keep the name fresh there. And then eventually maybe a few days or a few weeks later, they're like, oh, I've seen that uh, Nihilist has posted this cover. Maybe I should check it out this time. Or, oh, I've seen that a layer have been mentioned in the song a lot of times. Maybe I'll just check it out now. Yeah. And it may or may not lead to fans, but it will lead to infinitely more fans than if you didn't do it at all. And, and touching on uh, sort of like the business side of running a band, which people, uh, I suppose younger people who are watching this might not know too much about, um, or maybe maybe you do, I don't know. Um, running a band is like running a business in this day and age. Yes. Uh, and much more since music is, and the, the music industry has moved on and bands are having to be a lot more hands-on um, with their promotion and stuff like that. How, how do you go about running a, a band business per se? It's, I think, adapting to, I say adapting to change. It's, it's been this way for a while, but the, the whole thing of handing out physical CDs and selling physical CDs, that's, that's not really the best way to do it anymore. It's all about getting people to Spotify, getting people to YouTube, keeping fans engaged, you know, letting, them, letting the fans know that you, you genuinely do value them. You're not just churning out music and like arrogantly assuming everyone's going to listen to it and another thing that i think a lot of people shy away from is you've got to talk about money like you've got a like what we do with a layer is we have a monthly standing order we transfer money over into a savings account every single month and then when we need to spend hundreds of pounds on music videos or studio time the, the money's there because it's in a it's in a joint account and 
I think that's something that a lot of people shy away from is trying to do things on the cheap, like trying to save money by, oh, we, instead of going to this, this producer, why don't we go and record it with these people who um, aren't an established business and then we'll maybe get the, get the stems back from them after they've used it and see if we can get them mixed. And it's like, just you just need to go to a producer for the best part. I mean, it's, 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 I've, I've got nothing against like um, doing a DIY approach because not today, we recorded our very first EP with um, students from um, SSR in Manchester and then got them mixed. And it sounded really good. But I think for the extra quality you'll get from having a producer or an engineer's point of view, point of view in it, you just got to spend the money, which is which is a very sad and boring thing to say. A lot of people don't want to hear you've got to spend money, but you do. Yeah. It's it's better to spend more money and get a good product than spend half the money but get a product that's not as good. It's a, a lot of a lot of people like to think that oh, if you've got a good product, it'll sell itself. But the reality of it is, is that there's good products everywhere. You just go on Spotify. And you will find an incredible metal band or a pop punk band or an alt rock band. You will find one in five minutes. Yeah. So the way th there's a lot of good music out there. So you need to set yourself apart from everyone else with your image and your branding and your engagement. And sadly, I don't think releasing a, gr a great album or a great single is, is enough anymore. I think you've got to really be marketing yeah. yourself and pushing the music in the right way as well. Like, um, there's a guy I watch on YouTube called Damien Keys. And if anyone watching this wants to look into band promotion and how to market yourself, you should definitely watch him. Because some of the videos he does are based on ads. And he said that he's uh, seen bands that will just throw hundreds or even thousands of pounds into just generalized Facebook ads. And they get no return because they think that just throwing money at it can work. But it, it doesn't. You need to target your ads. You need to be actively engaging with an audience. I think there's two big things that make a good song. The first one is it's, it's the chorus. And a lot of guitarists and drummers don't like to hear that, but the vocals stand out. You need a solid hook and a good melody. And that is what people are gonna remember. People are gonna remember the chorus. So you need, you, you just need a really good chorus. And I think there's, there's a few ways of, I guess, working out what's going to make a good chorus. I think one of my theories for it is getting your vocalist to go to near the top of their range on the chorus and holding out notes that you could imagine yourself singing along to at a gig. I think that's one of the most important things. And the other thing for drummers and guitarists and the bassists is guitar parts that sound good don't necessarily feel fun to play. And you can see this with the super chuggy breakdowns and the sweet picking. That stuff is so fun to play, but it doesn't sound good. Some of the best sounding stuff can be the most boring stuff to play. And I think a lot of musicians really do mix up what's fun to play and what actually sounds good. One of the main things as well is not having an ego. Like you, you see this in, I've, I've played with guitarists. Um, so like rhythm and lead guitarists before. And there's all there's sometimes such a big ego of, well, I want to play the lead guitar part. Oh, but I want to use this riff that I've come up with. And you just have to you just have to throw your ego away sometimes. Like I've played in bands where I will play parts that other people have written because I know they're good. But then I've also played in bands where we'll have one member of the band forcing through an idea just because it's their idea. And you've, you've got to drop your ego, like, especially with metal as well. You don't need to shred everywhere. You don't need to show how good your sweeping and your string skipping is. You just need something that sounds good to people. You want, you want, to be, you want something yeah. that you can play it in a cr crowd of people and people will start nodding their heads. No one's going to come up to you and say, oh, though, that, that arpeggio three minutes in was beautiful. <laughs> They're not going to say that, but they are going to come up to you and go, yeah. oh, I really like, you know, the part of the chorus where they go and then they just start singing something. That's, that's what's realistically going to happen. Survive, for example. Uh, Survive came from that first riff. Um, I just was just playing my guitar and I started playing that riff and I just worked on it and then it came straight from there. 
but then losing sleep, for example, that came immediately from the chorus and the verse. I had a chorus idea and a verse idea. And then when I went to record them, I realized that they went together brilliantly. But then do you say, do you find a lot of songs? Oh, we just interrupted each other. <laughs> Sorry, man. So I when, I, when, um, so <laughs> man of glass, for example, the man of glass came from, so that intro riff of man of glass was originally a breakdown from a song that I wrote maybe five or so years ago. I just came back to it and I was like, I think this riff is so good to not be used. I need to use it somewhere. And then that's how Man of Glass started. I think there's a lot to be said about remote writing and remote recording. But again, you, I'll use some of our songs, for example, again, Losing Sleep. For a very long time, we only had from the intro to the end of the second chorus. And um, I remember the way we worked out where to go from it was I just rung out the, the D chords to, to end it because that's where we always ended. And Tom just kept singing and James stopped playing the drums. And then we kind of just noticed that the ring out sounded really good. Uh, me and James attempted, not very well because it's the first run through, but we attempted to sync up some, some stabbed chords over it. And that is everything from then just flew, flowed out naturally. Like the, the breakdown and the bridge, all of that just came more or less within a few days, all because of that one rehearsal where Tom kept singing. I like to think I don't have a very specific way of playing. Like, I, I like to think that when I write songs, they don't sound like each other. I, I guess I do have a lot of repeated things that I do. Like, I, I really like um, ringing out that open note like every metalcore band does. Um, I've really got on into sort of melodic tapping now like not just the really the, the super fast where you keep your left hand planted and just move your right hand all over the fretboard i've gotten really into melodic tapping and i've really moved away from from the sweet picking stuff as well i try and i try and keep it very riffy i like i think be, being the only guitarist in a layer i found that a lot of my writing and playing seems to accommodate for that so my the, the riffs and the songs that um the, the parts of the songs I write in general are very focused on being one guitar rather than a classic rhythm and lead split okay I like a I've, it's not showing up in recordings a lot but I've become a really big fan of 24th fret tapping so okay. tapping the 24th and then pulling off onto the 12 in the open it, it made its way into survive the survive main riff does that but um, I've not found a way to tastefully put it into anything else yet. <laughs> a lot of what I a lot of what I play and like jam and demo is stuff that and techniques that I don't really use for a layer or any other projects. I kind of try and make them make them more cohesive, I guess. Yeah, I so it follows a theme. I understand. And how do you decide on um, tunings? Uh, my tunings is I got my guitar set up to drop C once and I have kept it there ever since <laughs> basically I'm, I'm, I'm personally not a fan of this, this trend that's going around of going to like drop G or drop F or something in fact I go the opposite way so I keep, keep my guitar um, in drop C but then rather than playing in the key of C I like to play in D or E so yeah, I, I like yeah. a lot of the the fourth, fourth fret, fret and the second fret stuff. There we go. Fourth yeah. Fret, yeah. And uh, like a good example of that is um, our upcoming song, which we'll be releasing within the next few months. It's a second fret song, but because the root notes, the second fret, it means you can use the open in a different way. Yeah, so yeah. we have this really bouncy, heavy intro that yeah. we wouldn't be able to, wouldn't be able to play at all if we were playing in C. Yeah. So tunings, it's kind of, it's neither here nor there for me, really. I'm, I'm more than happy staying in C. But what I do like to do is change around the key a lot. I like to play in different keys because it, it opens up different chord progressions, essentially. Rather than having the lowest note being your root note, you can play your root note and then go to a lower chord. So yeah. it, it makes choruses a lot more interesting, I think. Yeah. Some of my, my favorite songs are all fourth fret songs. Drop C or even drop B or whatever fourth fret songs they're just um they're just the most emotive they have the biggest choruses mm. ashes of the innocent waking the demon reject, reject yourself. yourself yeah there you go 
Wait, we've been um, friends for far too long. <laughs> the thing is, I was I was just about to say Ashes of the Innocent as well. <laughs> but there was um there was a band called Miss May I on their um it was their fourth or the fifth album, Rise of the Lion. Their first single for it was drop I think it was Drop C or Drop B, but it was a fourth fret song. And it was very poppy compared to the rest of them, their 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 back catalogue. Yeah. And I think they got a lot of hate for that album and for doing like the poppier sounding songs, but I loved it. I thought putting that, that poppy bouncy element into what was a classic metalcore uh, band, I just thought it worked really, really well. How do you decide what song belongs to what project? Generally, I think, I think so. A layer definitely has a feel going for it. I think we're going for this very modern, progressive metalcore kind of sound like we, do, we don't do the whole like breakdowns everywhere um those was it the, the ninth and the sixth fret <laughs> noise we don't we we, we we don't really use a lot of that i mean it's got it's got its place there but we don't really use it a lot so i'll try and write if i come if i can think of something that's getting like progressive maybe got like a, a synthy or like a modern twist on it that that goes to a layer but then if i like the, the more classic metalcore sounding stuff, like the breakdowns and those uh, alternate picked uh, sixth and fifth string songs, uh, that doesn't really fit the Alea thing. So I, I generally keep them for other projects. Whereas anything that I think is going to be, anything that's got, that I think could have like a nice poppy chorus in it, that's a layer because I think one of the things a layer does well is getting really aggro verses with almost poppy choruses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that certainly seems to have um, been something that Alea's honed in on. It, it's it's got it's chorus driven. Yes, um, I I think I'm speaking for the rest of them as well when I say that like <laughs> we're very we're big on the choruses. I mean, survive and losing sleep. We we named those songs from a line in the chorus. Yeah. So we're we're very big on getting those catchy choruses, getting them memorable. And then trying to get them to stick in in the listeners' heads. Because Tom Tom's a really really good vocalist, and he's got a knack for writing all these like really catchy choruses. Yeah. And taking what is essentially a pretty bare bones chorus in terms of the guitar work from it, and really stepping it up. Like losing sleep. The the guitar work for the chorus is so minimalistic, but the vocals Tom put in it and the synth that the producer put into it really just absolutely took it to the next level it was made so much better by that synth and by tom's vocals very cool what would you say some of the your favorite gigs are that you've played the best gig i've ever played was with um the first pop punk band not today we played um i always forget which academy it was i think it was academy three and that was by far the no that was the second best gig um the best gig again with Not Today because most of most of my gigging was done with with Not Today. We only got four gigs with Open Waters and a layer yet to gig, so it's it's all down to Not Today. It was um, our EP launch show. So when we released the EP Headway, we played um, a, a release show for it in Zombie Shack in Manchester, and it was just insane. There's the most people we've ever had at a gig. It was the first time I ever crowd surfed while playing guitar. It was just <laughs> amazing. It was that is by far the, the best gig I've ever played. And how how do you keep an, an audience entertained on stage? By you, you've just got to make sure that the audience can see that you're entertained. No one wants to watch a band where everyone is just stood there and very robotic and not looking like they're enjoying themselves. They want to they they want to see the band having fun because then it makes it makes them engage more. And um, one of the things I always used to like to do was um, I'd have a, a wireless for my guitar. So just get into the crowd, just get in the crowd, run around with them, headbang with them. Um, I've, I've had it before where people have fed me drinks while I've been playing along to a song. <laughs> um, I remember once, I can't remember what gig it was, but um, I got myself into one of the pits. Uh, it was a pop punk gig and there was mosh pits, although we did have one heavy song. And there was, there was, um, a mosh pit and um i just got taken right to the floor just absolutely fell on the floor 
I was just lying on my back, still playing the guitar parts. <laughs> so I think I think one of the best things for keeping a, a crowd entertained is to just be an entertainer, just have yeah. fun with them, make make them make it obvious that you're having fun, that you want to have fun with them, and then it just it kind of it's just like a positive feedback loop. Once you are having fun, they have fun, and once they're having fun, you have even more fun, and it just it just keeps going and going and going. Yeah. And it's not having that wall between you. Yeah. You know, you know, the, there's a lot of this thing where it's just, well, well, we're the band. And once we go backstage, do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, like having a good time with everyone. I guess when you're in like the local band scene, there's a lot less of that. But we'd get people like coming up to us and like, oh, I've really enjoyed your set. And it's like, and just chat to them. It's like, yeah. have an actual conversation with them. No one, no one in the local band scene to my knowledge at least thinks that they're like oh i'm the band you're the the audience i don't think anyone really does that so we like to like before and after our gigs we'd always stand at the mer- at, at a merch table and try and like sell some t-shirts yeah. and just just be friendly be chatty yeah. no one no one wants to see a local band that's got this delusion of grandeur people just want to yeah. go there have some fun have a chat with people even like you and I were at the Wage War gig last year, and afterwards, yes. like we were just sat, stood chatting, yeah. And then, like we turned round, we went, "Is that Cody that's, over there?" That's Cody. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> we went on over to him. It's like, yeah, it's him, and he he was just there to have a chat, and yeah, it was oh, uh, stuff like that. I went that. to take oh, a picture of you both on my phone, yeah, <laughs> I and I was just just there, like, oh. How do how do how do these <laughs> newfangled iPhones get their flash on? <laughs> I was just they're fine. <laughs> so for for anybody who doesn't know, we we went to a, a gig last year. Wedge War. I've covered a couple of their songs on the channel. If you want to go check them out, uh, they're a great, very like brutal. Bru- I would band. I would recommend the disdain cover if uh, <laughs> I'm allowed you. to recommend one. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, that's that's a heavy one. And um, uh, after afterwards, uh, Sam and I were both at this gig. And afterwards, we met the guitar player, Cody, and I said, would you mind if I took a picture with you? So I gave Sam my phone, <laughs> and Cody's like, he's got his arm around me. So I'm like, oh, okay, so I've sort of got my In arm In my defense, kind of I, I don't have an iPhone. I, yeah, I, yeah. I use a Pixel. So when I when I got this iPhone, I'm like... I just thought oh, it would have been automatic. Use some technology. <laughs> I thought it would have as well. But no, he was, he was so happy with it. Like I know. he was just there laughing along. But it was like <laughs> I went to see a band called Bless the Fall a few years ago. And um their vocalist bassist came out and spoke to everyone. And I was just I just ran up to him and I was like, Oh Jared, I love you. I've been listening to you for so long. I'm sorry I can't talk. And he was just really nice. He was like, yeah. Oh, it's cool, man. And just got a picture and just really, really nice guy. That's and, how you do it, man. That is yeah. how you do it. You just when you see your favorite bands and they come out and they chat to you and just be a normal human being, it just it just makes it just makes it so much better and they just seem so much nicer. Yeah, massively enhances it. What are some other projects that you've got going on? Well, so I'm trying to get into mastering. That's one of the things I'm trying to do. It's uh, been a very slow start, but I'm wanting to get into uh, mastering some some music at, uh, at some point eventually. Yeah. Um. You may or may not know that uh there's a project that uh you're you're actually a part of you and me are doing something <laughs> maybe we'll um maybe we'll find out what that is in the in the coming year yeah maybe maybe we'll uh see how that's going and um, maybe it's maybe it's something really heavy we'll, we'll find maybe, out I guess. maybe it's something really like folky like an acoustic guitar project maybe maybe i've missed pop punk bands so much that me and jazz are yeah. starting a uh, a nice little uh blink 182 cover band yeah i'm gonna lop all my hair off and like go for the spiky cut yeah me too i'm gonna shave all of this bit down here and uh get that spiky mohawk i'm gonna really channel my benji from good charlotte yeah <laughs> or like you said maybe it might be really really heavy who knows? Uh, I yeah. guess I guess we'll see what the future holds. But yeah. if, if I was if I was going to lean one way, I'd say it's uh, incredibly heavy. But we'll see. We'll see. Um, I guess you'll have to subscribe to this channel to find out more. Yeah, you guys are going to have to uh, have to wait on that one. But you won't be disappointed. Oh, it's <laughs> it's if you if you like heavy stuff, you're going to like this. <laughs> um. So. Uh, 
your future plans for Alaya? Um, you mentioned you've got another single that's coming up. Yes. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the name of it, but I have said it a few times in this episode already. So it's, it's going to be called, it's called Deceive. Uh, we'll be releasing that um, sometime, sometime in the next few months. I'm not too sure when we need to get, you know, the whole logistics plan for it, get um, all the material for it. But Deceive will be coming out. Hopefully we'll be getting um, some form of um, either EP or album out maybe end of this year, next year, hopefully not sure. Um, and then when we can, we need to get our, our first gig done. We want um, to get on tour as soon as we can. Yeah. Uh, hopefully we can get a good uh, autumn or even a winter tour going. Uh, just releasing a lot of music and hopefully gigging a lot. So yeah. uh, if you follow all of these things here, oh no, my finger's disappointing, disappearing. Follow the, follow Alea on all of these things and you can catch up with us when we do manage to release on new music when we do announce our gigs and everything else. Yeah. So you've got all your music on Spotify, uh, Apple Music. Yeah. Spotify, Apple Music, everything on YouTube. Um, you can follow our socials there, over there as well, at Alea UK. We're on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. We're even on TikTok. We're really trying to <laughs> cling to our youth as much as we can. <laughs> and where but can yeah, people we're... find you on uh, uh, socials? I'm, I'm, I'm on Instagram. Uh, yeah. That's basically the only one. I'm on Twitter as well. Generally, I um, keep all my music posting on the Alea accounts, though. Okay. So if you want to hear my rambles, you can follow me. But if you want to <laughs> hear something that's actually useful and music related, then all of this stuff over here is where you want to follow me. Cool. Follow us. And uh, also, again, just to point out, there's quite a few. Uh, you've got two music videos out as well. Yes, we got um, two music videos and we got one lyric video. Yeah, cool. But so, again, we'll it, that's all on YouTube, out. but we're on Spotify, we're on Apple Music, Amazon Music, we're on Tidal, whatever Tidal is. So <laughs> anywhere you want to stream, you can you can you can find all our songs. So uh, sort of lastly on the um on this sort of stuff, uh, what advice would you give to anybody who's wanting to play guitar, maybe play in bands? Um, advice for playing guitar is learn as many songs as you can. It doesn't matter. Learn the modes. That's what you were uh, going to say. No, it wasn't. Honestly, <laughs> I think, I think, I think a lot can be said for learning music theory and learning modes. And I would absolutely recommend that. Yeah. But let's be honest, learning that stuff isn't necessarily fun. So yeah. when you first start playing guitar, just go and learn the songs that you want to, you want to learn. If, if you think they're too hard for you to play, learn them anyway yeah, uh, learn different genres like my playing improved dramatically once i joined pop punk bands because it was a genre i'd, I'd never played before uh, when it comes to being in bands i think you want to be you, you don't you don't want to half arse it you don't want to go in with uh maybe yeah we'll see what we'll see what we can do you want to, you want to go in knowing the genre you, you want to do knowing the type of music you want to uh, do you want to make sure that your bandmates are all in the same like headspace as you are you don't want to you don't want conflict of interest so, i mean like with with not today early on me being the metal kid them being the pop punk kids there was a lot of conflict of interest because i just wasn't i wasn't the right person for the band really if i'm honest i mean i'm, I'm glad i was in it because it definitely helped but you just want to make sure you're all on the same page yeah. and again the boring side of it is be prepared to spend money because PR, recording, all of this stuff, it costs money. And if, if you can DIY it and you can do it well and absolutely do it well, I know I've known some bands who do all their PR themselves. I know knew a band who recorded and mixed their EP themselves and it sounded mint. So if you can do it, do it. If you can't do it, just spend the money. Don't, don't try and don't try and half ass it. If you need to pay for something, make sure you're paying and get it, get it done properly. There you go. And now you guys know. <laughs> that is the one secret. Every time you see those ads that say the one secret to becoming a band, yeah. that's it. That, that is the one secret. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to finish this off with just a few quick fire questions, just this or that. I've um, been excited and scared about this part. <laughs> <laughs> some of them are musical. Some of them are silly, simple things. Um, but yeah, I think it's a little bit of fun maybe. How long do I have for each one? How much thinking time am I allowed? Oh, you can you can, you can hang about, and if you want to chat about them, it's all good. 
Okay, okay. I'm less scared then. That's fine. I'm not going to be like shooting them at you. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Fender or Gibson? Fender. Yeah. ESP. No follow-ups. Just Fender. Oh, ESP. We've 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 we we know <laughs> this. We know I don't um, like Gibson necks, and we know that ESP are my one true love. <laughs> uh, Marshall or PV? Marshall, absolutely. Really? Just for that clean tone. Okay. A uh, single coil or humbucker? Humbucker. Yeah. E again, easy. Figures. Active or passive? Uh, active. It's which is which is annoying because I always forget to um, have a battery with me. So if it runs out of battery, I'm always screwed. Uh, Ask Alexandria or Black Veil Brides. What year are we talking? Now, this present year, Black Veil Brides. Ten years ago, Ask Alexandria. Okay. <laughs> Motionless in white or falling in reverse? Oh, that's I a know. mean one, Jack. I had, I had a good time writing that one. Oh. I made every letter, like, hit the page. <laughs> oh. I thought, how can I ruin this man's oh. day? <laughs> I, 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 I genuinely can't answer. I genuinely don't know. Um, oh, that is an unfair one. I think... I can't. I can't answer. Are you gonna? Are you gonna push me for an answer, or can I yeah, leave it as? Of course, I am. Um, it's it's it has it has to be falling in reverse. It thought so. It, it's. I think when it when it comes to bands that I think have inspired me a lot, I think falling in reverse have to be up there, and it's such a shame because I motionless in white are also one of my absolute favorite bands. I remember my oh. Spotify, my Spotify wrapped uh, last year, four of my five top played songs were Motionless and White. There you go. So I may, oh, I may change my answer. I thought you had fun days. with that one. <laughs> but as it stands in this present moment, I'm going to have to say Fall in Reverse, just because of the impact that early Escape the Fate and then early Fall in Reverse had on me and my music taste. I think that is, yeah, I have to, I have to be fair to, to fall in reverse because they were there before Motionless and White, I guess. You're not going to sleep mean. tonight. No, that was horrible because <laughs> now I feel like I've insulted Motionless and White, <laughs> even though I listen to them all the time. Oh, is it Motionless and White though? Oh, it might be Motionless and White. No, I've, I've already answered. I've got time to regret my answer, which I already am doing, but... <laughs> I'm sure you could probably come up with some some ones for me. Actually, you know. <laughs> well, it's my Valentine or Metallica. Oh, mate! <laughs> right. <laughs> um, well, it's my Valentine or Fit for a King. A uh, Fit for a King. Ryan yeah, Kirby's like vocals. Yeah, Ryan Kirby yeah, may yeah. be the best vocalist, the ever. best metal vocalist ever. Yeah. He can do it all. Mm, all of it. He's incredible. Um. And so anyone watching this who's not listened to Fit for a King, go, go and listen so. to the album Dark go Skies. On, go and listen to Dark Skies, that thing. Youth Division. Mm. Uh, if, you, if you want one song to listen to, go and listen to Shattered Glass. Go listen to Backbreaker. Oh, man. Yes. That, uh, that I song saw, um, is exactly what it sounds like it is. There's, um, so Fit for a King and We Came as Romans did... Um, did a little short split EP where they covered one of each other, the vocalists covered one of each other's songs. And uh, We Came As Romans covered Backbreaker. And you know that really long scream at the end, I think it's like a 15, 20 second scream. Yeah, yeah. He just screams it and the second the music ends, you just hear him coughing and going, oh, did I get it? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I mean, he did, he nailed it. But it's, it's Brian Kirby is insane. Yeah, he is. Um... Nickelback or Stained? Uh, Nickelback, because Nickelback are a legitimately incredible band. Anyone who anyone who hates on Nickelback needs to go and listen to the song "Burn It Down" because that that song is in, I think it's in drop A. It's it in is like heavy. drop A, isn't it? Yeah, it's low. Nickelback are very very good, so no shame in saying Nickelback. Absolutely none. 
we might have the answer to this next one already. S Club or Steps? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's S Club. I mean, yeah, Tragedy okay. holds a strong place in my heart because that is a banging Steps song. It's got, it's got to be S Club 7. Uh, good guitar and a bad amp or a bad guitar and a good amp? That is not even a question. A bad guitar and a good amp, absolutely. You get all the sound coming from an amp and within 20 minutes of setting up that guitar yourself, just making little tweaks, yeah. you can make that guitar sound good. Very uh, very astute of you. You know exactly what I'd say to that. <laughs> you, you, would, you would get yourself a 15 pound line six if it could mean you could keep that Matt Tuck signature. <laughs> <laughs> I just stick to my bias FX. <laughs> um, <clears throat> arena gigs or small academies? This is this is to go to watch a game. Oh, to go to? Oh, yeah. uh, small academies, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's something to be said about sitting down at an arena. I remember going to see All Time Low. And Metallica, actually, sitting down with a beer, absolutely incredible. But there's, there's something about going, especially with metal, going to like a nice smaller venue and just being able to just go into the pits, being able to order a beer, but not being able to hear the bartender and be like asking for a dark fruits and getting like <laughs> a pint of Heineken or something and just rolling with it. <laughs> so yeah, de definitely for going, going to gigs, definitely um, the, the smaller venues are great. Uh, one big main gig or a festival? festival absolutely a festival yeah yeah i can just get drunk and run around like an idiot all these different bands <laughs> bolognese or lasagna bolognese i make a fucking fantastic bolognese that is my <laughs> one culinary expertise is i can absolutely demolish a brilliant bolognese <laughs> <laughs> would you rather um a full good um, none of this carvery crap. A good roast dinner or your favourite fast food? I'm going to say something very controversial here. Roast dinners are overrated. I said it and I mean it. I agree. You give, if you, if you want to offer me a Nando's or a KFC instead of a roast dinner, I'm jumping at that Nando's I'm or taking, KFC. I am taking the KFC 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, beer or spirits? Beer. I'm just uh, not a big spirits drinker anymore. All right, okay. There's um, something satisfying about that. <laughs> and lastly, tea or coffee? Coffee. Oh my God. I, I, I think my blood is 70% caffeine most days because I am a big coffee drinker. Yeah, same. I have probably about. Mind you, I think my four cups a day is quite a lot. Oh, yeah, that's, that's more than me, actually, yeah. But I do make mine very strong. Right, okay. I have... Um... Well, I, I have mine black. See, black one sugar. So I am very extra when it comes to my coffee. I'll have, I'll have the coffee. I'll have some steamed milk in it, some syrup, some some little cocoa powder on the top. Oh, you grind your beans as well, don't I you? I do. Yeah, I am yeah. a proper snob when it comes to coffee. I had um, an instant coffee, like a like a regular. I think it was like Nescafe Gold a few days ago, and it was disgusting. I have. I am such a snob when it comes to my coffee. It's, re it's really bad, actually. Life's too short to drink bad coffee, man. <clears throat> words of wisdom. Ways to, words to live by. <laughs> so is there anything else you want to uh, plug or put out there or um, um, mentions? If you like bouncy riffs and fun choruses, go check out these links over here. Um, if you like super low drop tunings and guttural vocals, then I don't know, maybe stick around on this channel and see what comes up in the, the coming coming months. Yeah. And um, yeah, check out our Spotify or Apple Music for our, our current singles we've got released. And uh, yeah, follow us to keep up to date with when we do release uh, Deceive in the next few months. Yeah, looking forward to that one. It's very bouncy. Cool. Um, so guys, uh, all these links and all that sort of stuff, I'm going to stick in the, uh, description at the bottom and Sam's going to remind me straight after this to do that. Um, as a matter of fact, yes, he's going to send me a text that, so I can put it as a reminder of my phone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but
But other than that, this has been a really great first podcast. I'm really glad you could uh, come on um, with me for the first I'm one. I'm more than happy to be here. The, when, when you asked me to do the first one, I felt a lot more honoured than I think I realistically should have. But no, like I, like I said, if if anything went wrong, it was fine because we're friends. Well, <laughs> but yeah, if, I've think... got, if I've got somebody who you know, I don't know, somebody I don't really know, and it or things are going all wrong from this end, it's going to be a little <laughs> yeah. bit awkward. They're just going to hang up on me. <laughs> no, I've enjoyed it. It's been good. It's been fun. I was I was scared for the either or questions at the end, but they were a lot nicer. I'm still fuming about that falling reverse and motionless and white one. That and you know cruel. what? I didn't think it was possible, but even after 15 years of friendship, I feel like I know you that little bit more. <laughs> oh, oh, that's cute. <laughs> no, it's been great. Well, um, well, man, once again, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I think we've really set a precedent for um, the next podcast that come. Yeah, um, ha happy to be on it. As, as yeah. you know, it's been it's been great. Okay, guys, that was Sam from Alaya. Um, you can keep up to date with his band in all the places that he mentioned. I'll leave uh, all the links down below to the, all the good stuff. Um, going forward, uh, I wrote a list of people that I'd like to have on here, and I've reached out to them, and uh, quite a few of them have said that they'd like to do it. So stay tuned for the next episodes that are going to come up. Um, in between then, you can follow me on Instagram. Right now, there's kind of like a quiet time between my videos, which I really don't like because I can't do community posts. So if you guys really want to keep up to date with me and what video is coming next and, and stuff like that, come and follow me on Instagram. I put pretty much everything up on there. Um, that's my social media of choice, and I put polls out and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, if, if you want to keep up to date with what I'm doing, Instagram. I'll leave a link below. So if you're still here, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm sure Sam really appreciates it too. And um, yeah, look out for the next podcast. Um, I've got a load of other stuff coming in the meantime. Um, covers, shorts, lessons, all that usual good stuff. So yeah, until then, I'm out. Peace. Mm -hmm.